days ago, an extremely important and annoying deadline passed. No doubt, most of you in this room had expended a lot of effort, probably incurred some frustration in filing the paperwork to meet this deadline. In fact, I suspect a great number of you employed the services of a paid professional in order to complete the busy forms with their many calculations. And I also surmise you were probably left with a feeling, like I was, that you may have missed some deduction or benefit or nuance that was costing you money. So I ask you, by show of hands this morning, how many of you enjoy the task of filing your federal income tax for every year? <laughs> Thank you, Rebecca. Glad you're having some fun. I work, I work in that field. <laughs> How many of you enjoy collecting and filing and organizing your receipts for charitable contributions, political contributions, of course we all do those, child care, medical and dental care, and so on, and statements and tax slips like T3, T4, T4P, T4A, T5, and on, an unending raft of other tax documents. How many of you think there is something wrong with the concept that you have to do all the work so that the government can take your hard-earned money from you or for you to try and get it back from them, their all-powerful hands. How many of you wish there was a better way of financing the expenditures of the federal government that took the burden away from you, the taxpayer? Well, as you know, the CHP is the political party of better solutions. Matter of fact, I believe what I'm about to present is one of the best solutions the party has to offer Canadians. This morning, I hope to convey to you why I think this is so, and provide an explanation of the platform policy called the National Sales Tax, also known as the Canadian Fair Tax. What I will present this morning is a fundamental, foundational economic policy of the CHP. I want to start with a quote that we have in our report from Andrew Coyne in the National Post. He says, put simply, the Canadian tax system is a creaking, productivity-killing wreck, hugely overcomplicated and riddled with unjustified deductions and exemptions that distort economic decisions and bleed the government of revenues, recouped by much higher tax rates than would otherwise be the case. End quotation. I'm old enough to remember the Royal Commission on Taxation under Kenneth Carter in the 1960s. A Canadian Cyclopedia <coughs> citation says, in 1966, the, the six-volume report declared that fairness should be the objective of the taxation system. The existing system was not only too complicated and inefficient, but under it the poor paid more than their fair share, while the wealthy avoided taxes through various loopholes. The commissioners proposed that the same tax be levied on increases in economic power of the same amount, however acquired. For as Carter reputedly said, a buck is a buck. End of quote. Yet here we are, 53 years later, and Rod Taylor recently sent me a clipping from the Hill Times, and it has the title, Canada's tax system isn't working for Canadians or our economy. <coughs> And it goes on to say, the reality is Canada's tax system is no longer fit for purpose and it is hurting Canadians, our competitiveness and our economy. Parliamentarians seem to agree. Well, the parliamentarians may agree, but they've not done anything but make it more complex, convoluted and mind-numbing. Aside facts here, after the income tax was revamped following the Carter Commission, the Fraser Institute estimated the number of pages in the Federal Tax Code was 573. In 2014, they estimated it had grown to more than 2,600 pages, a 355% increase. <coughs> An opinion piece last month in the Ottawa Citizen had this title, Income Tax Returns Are a Bureaucrat's Dream, a Citizen's Nightmare. The article starts, in 1960, I filed my first income tax return, a simple six-page document. After calculating federal tax, I added 49% of that for the province. It took less than 15 minutes. But year after year, government after government, things have changed. 
The current tax package is 170 pages, much of it incomprehensible to the ordinary citizen. On Monday, this past week, the Winnipeg Free Press featured an opinion piece with the enticing title, It's Time to Let Government Do Our Taxes For Us. The article begins, Many Canadians will be scrambling this week to file their taxes before the April 30th deadline. For some, that means paying professionals to do the paperwork for them, an expense not everyone can afford. For others, it might have entailed a whole weekend compiling, then inputting the information on their own. One study estimates it costs Canadians an average of over $200 each in expenses and time to file their taxes each year, or about four to six billion dollars annually. There is an easier, less pricey option that we should seriously consider, having the government do it for us." End of quote. I'm not too keen on that last part, I can assure you. So what can we do about this terrible situation? There are many proposed solutions regarding the sorry state of Canada's tax, federal and provincial, from further tinkering with the income tax based system to a complete overhaul, including moving to another basis for raising government revenues. Some of the approaches include a flat tax, a head tax, a national sales tax, and various iterations of the fair tax, amongst others. All of these have their proponents and their critics. However, in the United States, their version of the fair tax has received considerable attention and scrutiny. Since 2008, the CHP advocates a taxation system whereby the federal government collects taxes by means of a national sales tax, also known as the Canadian fair tax. CHP is the only federal political party proposing such a radical change in the method of collecting federal revenues. About two years ago, I knew nothing about this topic. Rod Taylor came along and asked our Economic and Finance Department to study the CHP policy and to make some recommendations. I've had a crash course in various taxation me methods since then. Our department has prepared a major report on federal taxation, which was submitted to Rod and the National Board last year. I want to take a moment here to acknowledge my colleagues in this endeavor. Kevin Schulte, Kareem Wurenka, and James Wilson. The bottom line of our report was we supported the national sales tax concept as CHP policy. So I want you to imagine what it would be like if there was a totally different, could I say revolutionary, way of funding the federal government. In this scenario, there's no federal income tax, no federal corporate or business tax, no death tax, no inheritance tax, no GST, and no capital gains tax. Under this scenario, everyone will have to think about taxes in a different way. Income, what we earn, no longer has to be documented, measured, and tracked for federal tax purposes. With the removal of the federal income tax deduction, your net pay or your net pension would suddenly increase. Disposable income would therefore increase. You could save it, reduce your debt, or spend it on goods and services. The entire Income Tax Act and the associated regulations and bureaucracy would be eliminated. No federal income tax forms to complete each year, leaving more time and resources available for other, more important endeavors. No deductions to track. No tax credits. No charitable status for organizations, including churches. Currently, in order to obtain a federal charitable tax exemption number, a registered charity must fulfill a long list of obligations. Under the fair tax concept, however, none of these obligations would exist. There would be no charitable tax exemption number as there would be no tax receipts to be issued. Charities, including churches, would be free to use their resources <coughs> to further their objectives in whatever manner they thought was appropriate. Scrutiny would not be by the government, but by their supporters and their donors. And I know from personal experience with my own church, it would lift a significant administrative burden caused by the need to fill out and submit government forms, report salaries, track donations, and issue tax receipts. 
There would also be no need for tax shelters, like tax-free savings accounts, RRSPs, RESPs, as these are intended to protect funds and the earnings on those funds from taxation. The amount of record keeping for medical receipts, dental receipts, donation receipts, business related expenses and so on would be greatly reduced. The reduced bookkeeping and paperwork for businesses and individuals would provide an instant boost to the economy. Now moving from our current taxation to one involving national sales tax would reverberate throughout the economy. Impacts would be varied and potentially dramatic. It's probable at first, when you put a new tax in, that consumption would drop. But studies have shown that at the end of the first year, consumption would increase by 2.4% over what it would have been under the current tax system. And after the 10th year, consumption would be increased by 11.7% over what it would be under the current tax system. Research also predicts that disposable income will be 11.8% higher after 10 years. Families will be encouraged to save and invest as the tax burdens are removed on investments. This one really irks me. I save or invest after tax money and the earnings get taxed again. It's not fair. Under the national sales tax, money invested earns more money. The increased savings and the invest investing help create a healthy country with better economic growth. Thus, the new method will create jobs in Canada by acting as an incentive to savings and investing, which is vital to a thriving economy. Canada has a significant trade deficit with other nations. Adopting this tax method will provide a major boost to the competitiveness of Canadian industry. As a result, Canadian businesses will be much less likely to locate their production and head offices in other countries, and foreign countries will have an incentive to locate in Canada. The result of this real stimulus to our economy will be more Canadians gainfully employed. And this is precisely what we saw happen in the United States. The Trump administration lowered the corporate business tax. It is now less than it is in Canada. There's been much wringing of hands as the attractiveness of doing business in the U.S. has grown significantly. That is why the U.S. proponents of the fair tax want to be the first to implement this method of raising government revenues because of the boost of the economy, it would be significant. I was at an investment seminar two weeks ago, and the investor put this uh, chart up, which is the market performance, one year stock market returns in Canadian dollars at the end of March. Number one country, the United States, 13.4% performance, and the investor said the major reason for that was the tax cuts. Last year, last February, uh, an article came out in Bloomberg News and it says that Walmart stores is boosting the starting hourly wage to $11 and delivering bonuses to employees capitalizing on the U.S. tax overhaul to stay competitive in a tightening labor market. With wage increase and bonus payment, the company is sending a high profile thank you to the U.S. government for slashing the corporate tax rate. Walmart's decision makes it the latest corporate titan to plow expected tax savings into employee payouts. Boeing, AT&T, Wells Fargo have all made similar announcements in recent weeks. The CEO of Walmart said, tax reform gives us the opportunity to be more competitive globally and to accelerate plans for the United States. Quoting our platform once again, the federal government is responsible to collect taxes in a way that respects the citizen's right to private ownership and the enjoyment of property, and one that is fair and treats all taxpayers equally. The federal government should not collect taxes in a way that acts as a disincentive to savings and investing, and that discourages productivity and adversely affects economic output. Government, in turn, has a duty before God to conduct its economic affairs with honesty, impartiality, integrity, and a view to good stewardship of the taxes entrusted to it by the people of this nation." End of quote. I believe the national sales tax satisfies <coughs> these principles. So let's take a look at the mechanics of this tax. 
The national sales tax is a single rate federal retail sales tax collected only once at the final point of purchase of new goods and services. Every new good or service purchased would be subject to the tax. Food, clothing, accommodation, and included. No exceptions. The tax is, divide to be re is devised to be revenue neutral for the first year of operation. It raises the same amount of revenue as is raised by the current tax law. After the first year, revenue is expected to rise because of the growth generated by this tax plan. And at that time, Canadians and Parliament will have to decide whether to lower the tax rate or to spend the additional revenue on debt reduction, for instance. Retail businesses collect the tax from the consumer, just as provincial sales tax is done today. Retailers simply collect the tax and remit it to the government. All businesses serving as collection agents receive a fee for performing that job of collection. Business-to-business -business purchases for the production of goods and services are not taxed. So, I imagine right now, like it was last night when I was doing a little talk on this, you're starting to think, what would the national sales tax rate be? Before answering that question, I want to remind you that one of the basic tenets of the CHP is smaller government. If citizens are capable of doing something on their own, the government should not be involved. And also remember that the abolition of the federal income tax would reduce government expenditures for their administration. For instance, the Canada Revenue Agency, the budget according to 2017-2018 estimates, was $4.6 billion dollars of which 934 million is for the operation of the department. Now some of the operations would still be needed, but a large portion of that funding would no longer be required. According to the Public Accounts of Canada, not all federal government revenues are tax-based. About 18% of the revenues come from non-tax sources. So only 82% of the total revenues would have to be raised by this national sales tax. CHP believes in a balanced budget and paying down the federal debt. Public debt charges amounted to 8.6% of expenses in 2015-16. In our review paper, we looked at total federal revenues in 2015-16 and the GDP for the same period. In doing so, quite surprising to me, we also found out there are several definitions for GDP, and even under those definitions, there's different amounts related to them. Uh, one of the things we were doing was checking the other parties' platforms, and the Green Party has a particular number for GDP, which didn't seem to match what another party had for GDP. So it seems to be a little bit of a, a uh, choose what you want kind of. So we estimated that the amount of tax on the G GDP that year to fund the federal government would be in the range of 15 to 16 percent. And yes, that would be on top any provincial sales tax that was applicable. But you, the consumer, decide how much tax you are willing to pay by how much you choose to consume. Obviously, the more money you have, the greater the potential to spend and thus pay tax. But if you save or invest, you don't pay tax. And unlike our system today, where you invest with after-tax dollars, any increases in the value of those savings or investments are also not taxed. They're 100% yours. Reflect back to the words of the Carter Commission that said fairness should be the foremost objective of the taxation system. <coughs> that is the foundation of the national sales tax. It is also very apparent when you get your sales slip, there it is at the bottom, national sales tax. You see it every time. It's also simple to understand, it's universal, it has a low administrative burden, it can be readily adjusted, and it provides an incentive to work, to save, and invest. A word of caution here. The introduction of the national sales tax is not something that will suddenly happen when CHP forms the government. It will take some time for planning and transition. As stated on the CHP website, over time the CHP would initiate a national discussion on the elimination of all income taxes and the replacement of that revenue stream with a fair tax on goods and services. That would be a consumption tax rather than an income tax, regarded by many economists as the fairest form of taxation. 
This could not be done with one dramatic shift, but would require a series of steps to implement. Canadians deserve to be consulted on the form of taxation by which government services are provided." End of quote. Now the biggest pushback you will hear about a consumption tax is that it is regressive. It penalizes the poor more than the rich. So in our report, we discuss something called the prebate. This was the subject of perhaps the greatest amount of debate amongst our department members, and I mean we debated this one. Prebate is a term for a tax rebate on life's necessities, <coughs> excuse me, but paid in advance. The payment is made quarterly based on the number of persons in the family unit. Critics of the tax say life necessities, food, clothing, shelter, should not be taxed up to a certain level. The prebate is a more efficient method of not taxing necessities than having complicated rules about what constitutes a necessity. With the prebate, there are no exemptions or deductions to be claimed or calculated. Now, our department's major issue with the prebate is that it requires a government infrastructure for its administration. And this means paying a higher rate of tax to compensate. In fact, tax expert Jack Mintz, writing in the National Post last year, said, and I quote, if we decide that we want to use the tax system to redistribute income, that can be achieved in several different ways. We can have graduated tax rates, exempt income below a certain level, or both. We can give tax credits to people facing specific burdens, for instance, raising children or coping with the cost of a disability. Consumption taxes, such as the GST, can exempt necessities, including food, rent, and children's clothes. But each of these mechanisms makes the tax system more redistributive. They come with an economic cost, the necessary higher taxes paid, rates to pay for them, and the discouraged work, risk-taking, and investment, and the cost to government to administer the system and to taxpayers in navigating it." End of quote. Now, because of the conflict, conflicting views we had on this particular subject, whether or not to include the prebate in the CHP platform was left for the next national convention to decide. So certainly, if you're interested in this, come on out to the next convention and have a nice debate over this particular aspect of the policy. Now, there's some spin-off effects to this particular policy. Do you recall that I said that the tax applies only to new goods and services that you purchase? Have you ever walked around on garbage day and cringed when you saw the good, useful items put out for collection? I sure have. Because under the national sales tax, there would be no federal tax on used items, this would create a demand, giving used goods a second chance and keeping them out of the landfill. It might even lead to better made products which have a life, longer lifespan. I've had the pleasure of discussing policy with the chairperson of the Health and Education Department. Their efforts at recreating a sense of personal responsibility for one's health is augmented by the economic policies in our platform. Things like the personal income security account and the national sales tax put control of personal finances firmly in the hand of the individual, not a government body. Anyone who is asked if they want to work extra hours at their job will tell you the rate of pay has to be extra because the additional tax that is taken off of that extra income. This increases business costs and can be a disincentive to the worker. Under the national sales tax, the extra cost and the, the uh, dis disincentive are diminished. And any working couple will tell you that incorporating a second income into the family can bring additional tax burdens, such that the income needed to offset them and provide the desired boost to family resources is greater. Not so under the national sales tax. Families can earn a little more and keep almost all of it. They can better balance family demands with working demands. Now, I was hoping to be able to give a couple of examples. Do I have some time to, to do that, Peter? Am I doing okay? All right. I want to give you a couple of examples of how this tax would work based on uh, our, uh, our report. <coughs> Uh, one example we have is for the purchase of new farm equipment. A farmer buys a new piece of equipment. As the farm operation is considered a business, 
and the equipment is used to produce a taxable product, food, the fair tax is not applied to the purchase, but a provincial sales tax might apply. At any taxes the farmer collected from the sale of goods would be remitted to the government less an administrative fee for collecting the tax. I have a special place in my heart for uh, home-based businesses. So uh, we did an example here. Uh, Colleen operates a small business making crafts and selling them at a local craft sales, as well as from her website. She purchases her, uh, purchases her supplies and pays GST and provincial sales tax on her purchases. When she sells an item, she charges GST and provincial sales tax, remitting them once a quarter to the relevant tax authorities. Because her revenues are below the minimum, requiring a GST number of her own, she does not claim the GST rebate, effectively charging her customers tax on her tax. She tracks her sales and costs and fills out her federal and provincial tax forms each year, paying income and business taxes as required. <laughs> Now, under the national sales tax environment, the situation is quite different for Colleen. As Colleen is registered as a business, she does not pay any additional national sales tax on her purchase supplies, only the provincial sales tax. When she sells an item, she charges both the national and provincial sales tax, remitting them once a quarter to the relevant tax authorities, thus a processing fee of 0.5% of the national sales tax collected. As there is no federal income tax or business tax, there's no further, re no further reporting requirement from the federal government. And if the province adapted the fair tax concept, any tax reporting is eliminated. I thought I might have put a little push in here for the CHP social media channels. Uh, following a late, uh, Facebook Live event that Peter and I did on February the 12th, Someone asked a question about what the benefit of this tax regime was for pensioners. Well, good question. I'm a pensioner, so I thought I could provide a, an answer to that. So, here's my answer to that, that question. As a pensioner myself, I see many, many benefits. The amount of record keeping, receipt tracking, and paper filing to, I do for myself and my spouse is not insignificant in our efforts to submit the annual federal tax return. The national sales tax would eliminate the need for this. We have saved and invested over our working years only to see a portion of those resources siphoned to taxes on capital gains and interest payments. We have set up two TFSAs, two RIFs, an RESP for our grandchildren, organized our fairs so as to minimize inheritance taxes, and so on. All steps necessary if there is no, all steps unnecessary if there is no income tax, no inheritance tax, no capital gains tax. We would prefer to pay a visible, timely federal sales tax rather than a hidden, complex, poorly understood, resource draining, red tape laden federal income tax. End of quote. You can tell I don't particularly like paying taxes. <laughs> I had an opportunity about a, a year ago, uh, May 2018, to present this policy to CHP Ottawa audience. The reaction I got back was, how come we haven't heard more about this topic? It's great! So that's why I'm here today. There are a number of questions that were raised, but I want to single out this one. The question was, families, especially larger ones, pay a much higher level of tax more consumption required to meet the needs of the family than a single person or a couple with the same salary. This seems unfair and we force, force them to turn to the community, not government, for support. So in response I said, adjusting the situation for the family would break the basic concept of universality and no exceptions upon which the national sales tax is based. As soon as you start down the road to exemptions, you get forms administrators, managers, technology support, office space, hiring, and so on. And where's the line drawn? Three children? Four? Five? And don't all citizens benefit from the services provided by the federal government? National defense, weights and measures, social benefits. Should the beneficiaries not contribute to their operation through taxes? 
I want to conclude, conclude with these words from the party constitution. It says that civil government exists to serve the people, not the people the civil government, and that people are therefore obliged to sustain civil government through just taxation." End quote. The national sales tax is a far more just and fair system of raising civil government funds than the current tax system, and does not force us to serve the government. God has graciously entrusted us as his stewards with the care, development, and enjoyment of everything he owns. We are responsible to manage his creation well and according to his desires and purposes. Wasting precious resources, building, maintaining, and feeding a huge, inefficient, stifling tax machine is not how we manage well what he has entrusted to us. Our department believes that with this national sales tax or fair tax policy, CHP does have a better solution for our economy. To those of you here who support the party, you need to learn about and promote the heck out of this best solution. And to the candidates present this morning, thank you for choosing to put Christ on the federal ballot. If my department can be of any assistance for information on economic and financial policies, please get in touch. There is no doubt in my mind that together we can show Canada that our economic policies support life, family, and freedom. Thank you for your interest and attention.